coming up on Stu Does America. It's our 100th episode. Yeah. Can you believe they haven't canceled this thing yet? I mean, and they say threats of physical violence won't get you anywhere. Lesson learned, suckers. <laughs> uh, immediately after the show tonight is the Stu Does America 100th anniversary celebration. Stu Does Power Hour. Chad Prather, Sarah Gonzalez from the News and Why It Matters, Bill Richmond from Louder with Crowder, and Jason Buttrell from the Glenn Beck Program will attempt to coherently talk about politics and issues as we do a power hour. That's one shot of beer per minute for an hour, kids. Now, we want you to play along with us at home. We'll explain the uh, whole situation further later on in the program, but you'll need about seven beers, so get prepared. I tell you, it's easy at the beginning, but it gets really hard later on. It's available on YouTube only, so go there and get subscribed. Just search for you, uh, search YouTube for Stu, and I'll be the first one there, or all the links are always at stewdoesamerica.com. It's great, whatever. We wanted to make a countdown clock to tell you how close the special was, but we spent our budget on beer, so just figure it out this way. If you're watching live, just take 60 and subtract however many minutes after the hour you currently are, and then that's when it's going to start. And also, if you're watching on demand, it's already posted. Just go watch it if you want right now. It's Stu Does Power Hour on YouTube coming up in like 58 minutes. Assuming The Blaze allows this show to get to its conclusion, this little club of ours will have met 100 times. 100 times the graphs, 100 times the sarcasms, 100 times in the same suit. A lot of people ask, how many suits do you have? One. I have one. <laughs> one suit. This suit, every episode, for 100 episodes. How often do you get it dry cleaned? Hmm. <gasps> Once. <laughs> in 100 shows. When you only have one, you can only get it dry clean when you're on vacation. I mean, it's, and the place that sold it to me is closed because, you know, people can't stop running around inhaling each other's droplets. I recently did order another suit, but it kind of gives you the sense of how much confidence I had in this show. How many suits do you need, Stu? Uh, one should do it. I do have more than one shirt, obviously. Uh, I have two. It's called a rotation, okay? That's what it's called. Thanks to you, we've gone from zilch to over 26,000 YouTube subscribers, 3,200 five-star reviews on iTunes, millions of downloads and views on podcasts and through Blaze TV and Pluto. This show debuted in February, which means basically we ushered in the COVID-19 pandemic. You're welcome. Who would have thought that an innocent pre-launch vacation to buy a few pangolins in Wuhan would have caused so much trouble? We've had some good titles like uh, Stu Does Dallas. Stu does Alyssa Milano, and Stu does models, and some really terrible titles like Stu does old people, <laughs> Stu does Andrew Cuomo, and Stu does Glenn Beck. Still the worst. Now, I may be a little bit biased, but one thing I've learned doing the show is that all of you are awesome, and everyone else in the world sucks. They're just terrible. Have you noticed this? What is up with them? Everyone wants to go get everyone else fired. No one wants to take personal responsibility. And everyone seems to want to set their local target on fire for one reason or another. How did this world get so screwed up? How do we come to a place where half the country is demanding a safe space? As I've con uh, considered that question over the years, I've, I've always went back to uh, one summer in the 1980s. I was visit visiting my grandparents in New York, and I went to uh, an amusement park an action, uh, named Action Park in New Jersey. This place is insane, okay? The smell of chlorine and sunblock, the wave pool, water slides, inner tubes, and of course, broken bones and massive blood loss. For many Americans, especially those growing up on the East Coast, going to Action Park in New Jersey was a rite of passage. The slogan felt like a promise. There's nothing in the world like Action Park, definitely true, where you're the center of the action. And yes, some people called it Traction Park, or Class Action Park because there were occasional injuries and lawsuits. But that was the point. You had the control. It's sort of what our country used to be. 
Yes, you had the right to be an idiot. You had the right to pay the consequences. You could take a risk if you wanted to. No one's going to coddle you into safety. Action Park, to me, was the last gasp of that American mindset where you're in control. It's your destiny. If you act sane, you're going to have the time of your life. If you're an idiot, you're probably going to the hospital. Congratulations. And when Action Park closed, it was a symbolic moment. The moment where regulators and safe spacers and social justice profiteers started pushing this country in a direction that we've never been able to fight off. It's when helicopter parenting started to defeat free-range parenting. It's when a bruise went from a badge of honor to a trip to the clinic. You've never seen an amusement park like this. It's bonkers. I remember vividly standing uh, uh, in the park, staring at one water slide with my mouth open for what seemed like a half an hour. Not sprinting to the other slide like every other kid to go down again. Just standing in awe at a ride that was closed. It was called the Cannonball Loop. It was a water slide that had a massive drop and then actually attempted to flip you upside down in a loop. It was nuts. There are only a few pictures of it that even exist, and this is one of them, but it was real. I saw it with my own eyes, and there was like no math that went into this thing. It looked like a, it was built by a bunch of laid off welders after it was sketched on a napkin, and it was. That's exactly how it was built. That should tell you something about the guy who built the park, Gene Mulvihill. Uh, and it should tell you, tell you something else about Gene. Uh, the first person who ever tested this slide was his son, Andy. He put his son on that thing. That, my friends, is America. I want some fireworks to go off. As the quarantine went on and on, most of my time was spent in spreadsheets and pandemic data. And, you know, look, other than some great times with my family, about the only fun thing I can remember doing is reading a new book from Andy Mulvihill. Action Park, Fast Times, Wild Rides, and the Untold Story of America's Most Dangerous Amusement Park. It's just a great book. I mean, the stories are completely insane. It's a book you have to read if you like this sort of stuff. And the story has now been purchased by Hulu for an upcoming series. It's Friday. It's our 100th episode. We've got Stu Does Power Hour on YouTube coming up. And we'll talk to the son of the creator of Action Park, the first person and one of the only people in the entire world to actually go on the Cannonball Loop water slide and survive. Andy Mulvihill is next. If you go to fastblast.com slash blaze, one thing you will not find is advice on how to do a power hour. They will never tell you to drink one shot of beer per minute for an hour because that's really dumb. They also won't tell you to go down a looped water slide because that's also really dumb. What they will tell you how to do is how to uh, lose weight with intermittent fasting. Um, it's exploding in popularity, you've heard about it. Uh, it's got a lot of people are trying this now, it's different. Um, and that's why it works, I think, because we've all tried these same things over and over and over again. If you're one of these people like me that went down the same roads a million times and never had any success with it, you know, uh, intermittent fasting is great because it is, it's something where you can kind of set real rules, you follow the rules and it works every single time, at least it does for me. Lifestyle change is made easy with Fast Blast. Uh, they help you with the Fast Blast smoothie, which is fantastic. Um, it's uniquely formulated for intermittent fasting, gives you great energy, fewer cravings, and the best part is it's very simple and it tastes great. Just drink one every two to three hours, combine it with lots of liquids, and it'll keep you satisfied. They do a great job at Fast Blast because they'll map out the entire program to you. At no point will they put, hey, do a dumb power hour on a Friday. They don't say that. They'll give you good advice. Go there. Do your own homework. Uh, learn more about intermittent fasting and the Fast Blast smoothies at fastblast.com slash blaze. That, this slash blaze part, as you may know, is important because that's how they know you like this stupid show. So get started today with Fast Blast for a healthier and smaller you. It's fastblast.com slash blaze. Andy, welcome to the program. Hey, Stu, it's so great to be on. This is really exciting. <laughs> I can't believe it. I'm so excited. I was a kid. I grew up in the Northeast. I went to Action Park. Uh, it was a, a time I have remembered ever since. I've obsessed over Action Park for years and years, and I'm so excited that it's finally getting the attention it deserves. 
well, you're a survivor, man. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can tell you, well, let me tell you one experience I had there. I stood in Action Park. And this is, you know, I'm a kid. I want to go on all the rides as fast as I can. It's, I guess it's got to be the mid 80s at some point. And I, I, but the thing I remember most of the entire visit was what seemed like a half an hour as I stood there on this hill and looked over at this looping water slide and thought to myself, what on earth is that? And could anyone make it through? It was closed the day I was there. However, you are the first person who ever went through this water slide. You got to tell people about this experience. Well, you know, my father was a pretty unique guy and a creative guy, and anybody that does anything always wants to be able to do a loop to loop, whether it's on a motorcycle or on a skateboard or a bicycle. And he said, "Why not do it with a water slide?" <laughs> so he drew a little sketch on a napkin, and he had a guy build it, and a guy named Dick Crow, and uh, he needed it tested. So <laughs> I just happened to be there when it was ready to be tested. Thank God I had my hockey equipment in the car, put it all on, and uh, went up the tower. It was in the parking lot, and the thing was high, and it was scary, and the slide was <laughs> steep. But I plummaged in, and it was dark, and I went down, and as soon as I hit the upper loop to spin around, my stomach got pulled through my throat. I was all discombobulated. It spit me out on the ground. We didn't have a pool, so it was like on a tarp across the block. Yeah, top. yeah. I survived, but man, what a time it was. <laughs> it's incredible. I mean, I searched the internet for years to try to find pictures of this thing. There was like three or four pictures that existed uh, that I could find anywhere. Eventually, I saw a little bit of video, but it's really rare and it's hard to find. Um, and it's it, it's one of those things that does not look real. The first time I showed it to someone, they, they thought it was Photoshopped. Um, when I was there, it was not open. How often was it open? Did people ride it a lot? No, you know, it was one of those experiments that didn't quite work out. My dad was the type of guy that would, he would try everything and anything because he always wanted to give you something special, something you'd never seen before. So we opened that and we thought we had it figured out, but we didn't because the inconsistency in weights and the way people would ride, sometimes when you got up on the top of the loop, you could fall off the top of the wall to the bottom. Even if it was yes. 12 inches, you could smack your face. So we've had it open a couple of times, closed it. Try to rejigger it. Tried it again. Didn't quite work. We never perfected that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you said he drew it on a napkin. He said, why not do a loop on a water slide? There's a lot of reasons to not do a loop on a water slide, Andy. Well, not if you're Gene Mulvihill, man. He was an entrepreneur. He was really an American pioneer. He was trying to do something that hadn't been done before. You know, amusement parks back then, there weren't a lot. And there certainly weren't a lot of water parks. So he was kind of making it up as he went along. But the most important thing is to do something extraordinary, do something great and really entertain people and give them a thrill. You know, what he did is he took the idea of skiing and applied it to amusement park. If you wanted to go on the bunny hill and go slow, you could do that. But if you wanted a thrill, you go up top, you go down the steeps, you go fast. And it was thrilling, but there were risks associated with it. Mm -hmm. and You could get a little beat up. My dad was OK with that. Yeah. I mean, it was really an idea of. You participated in the rides. You didn't. You weren't like a victim of the rides. You 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 participated. You decided where you were going to go down. And this goes back to one of your original rides. Uh, I think the original, which is the Alpine Slide. And I went on that as well. And I I know at one point I fell off and skinned my knee to a level that I, I can't even comprehend today. But it was a situation where I when that happened, I decided I was going to be an idiot and go full throttle. And it was my. It was my doing. And that was something, you know, it's certainly lost today. And it was probably even rare back in 1979, 1980. You know, he wasn't afraid to let people have control over what they were doing. As long as they kind of were explained what the risks were, he wanted to let them have a thrill. And he thought it was OK if he got a little banged up in the process. Um, you know, there was, as our saying said, there's nothing in the world like Action Park. Other amusement parks, they strap you in, they spin you around. It's a little thrill. And Action Park, you controlled it. You were the controller of your own destiny. You want to go fast, you went fast. You want to go slow, you go slow. And it made for a super exciting place 
that people just had a great time and came back in the droves. Yeah, and you can tell by the way people are talking about it. So now there's an HBO Max documentary coming out. Uh, the book, by the way, is, uh, is if, you have, if you don't have it, I will tell you, I, I read this in quarantine. It came in right at the beginning of quarantine uh, to my office. I read it. It was the only fun thing I did during all of quarantine. I love this book. I cannot recommend it highly enough. The stories are utterly amazing. You will not believe this was a real place. You will not believe it. It was, I was there. I saw it all from by my own eyes. The book is Action Park, Fast Times, Wild Rides, and the Untold st Story of America's Most Dangerous Amusement Park. Um, I, I want to go a million different directions with you here, uh, Andy, but let me highlight one thing that I've thought about when I thought about Action Park over the years, and I've made this point on the air several times. I think of Action Park as this turning point in American history where it's like we hit the end of a, of, a, of a country that took personal responsibility and assessed risks on our own and didn't expect to be coddled. And with the end of Action Park, to me, was the rise of a litigation culture, was a rise of the you're going to be you know, sort of coddled and, and, you, and everything's going to be safe and you, there's no risk in your life and don't worry about it. Is that a, I mean, I kind of felt that that came through in your dad's philosophy a little bit, that he wanted to have that experience. He wanted to have people to have control of their own lives and experiences. Hey, my dad was a real conservative. He's a real believer in freedom and a real believer in people and the, the, the whole um, American spirit. And he, he thought it was okay to let people have control. He thought it was something special for people to have control. And he was one that never took no for an answer. He was not a big guy that loved to follow rules. <laughs> no. He certainly didn't like all the regulators that came after him. And he just pushed around and he turned around and he went different ways. He maneuvered. I tell you, he kept the place of business for 20 years, even though they were going after him. And um, it was, you're right, things have changed. You know, the big question one can ask is, what's the expectation that someone has when they come to an amusement park? Is it, should you give them an experience where it's impossible to get hurt? He was a pioneer. So he was he said, look, this is a participation park. It's not an amusement park. You're responsible. And with that responsibility, you can do some amazing. I mean, we had a water slide with a jump. You could fly through the air on a water slide. People <laughs> loved it. And you know, why not? It was great. And you're right, we've lost that. I mean, we have that now. My daughter's a downhill mountain biker. She's a she's a out-of-bounds skier. She's a rock climber. You know, it's like the X game stuff, but it doesn't happen in amusement parks anymore. It happens outside of them. Yeah, that does not surprise me at all that your daughter is, is like that, <laughs> just knowing the, the family history. Um, it's interesting because there was almost like a cultural sort of mesh point at Action Park, where it was this tension sort of uh, as the tension between sort of per personal responsibility and what we kind of have now with this sort of safe space culture. And, you know, I think a lot of people are so attracted to the um, the history and sort of that uh, retro feeling they have when they talk about Action Park because they remember it. They remember be it, it made you feel alive, even though you were probably a little closer to death than you should have been. You know, everyone that went to Action Park has a story. I've got thousands and <laughs> oh, yeah. we picked the best ones. And the great thing is. You know, you turn on the TV today and the news, oh, my gosh, between the being locked in COVID and, and the riots, it's like if you grab this book, you can just escape all that and go back to the 80s and feel the freedom. You know, when I had Johnny Knoxville, I heard he was going to make a movie and I talked to him. It was a movie inspired by Action Park. Yeah. And I talked to him. All he wanted to hear about is he kept on saying, your father would let people do whatever they want there, jump wherever they want. Wow, that's crazy. That's great. And so... <laughs> it's true. <laughs> You'd think a guy who did the show Jackass would, would understand some of this. Uh, that's good to hear that he was behind it. Um, it. Let me give you this quote from the book. This is uh, from Action Park, Fast Times, Wild Rides, and the Untold Story of America's Most Dangerous Amusement Park. Give the idea of the philosophy here. Here it is. The park was a metaphor for individuality. People didn't need to be legislated into submission, regulated to narrow corridors of living. Action Park was America. Six Flags and its preset coaster pass was communist China. I did not understand how anyone could support any authority forcibly dictating how others should live. It was too George Orwell, too suffocating. Man, I mean, that, is, that's, that connects with Americans maybe right now more than ever before. Hey, man, that's what I, my dad taught us about in life and just, you know, legalize freedom again, man. That's what we need. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Um, the, uh, it's interesting, you, worked, you actually worked on the Reagan campaign, is that right? 
Yeah, I was in 1980. It was actually one of the few summers that I missed part of the action park season. I went down and I, I worked for a guy named Steve Antosh in the, in the national headquarters and uh, for the Youth for Reagan campaign. And we went all over training kids on how to win mock uh, uh, elections to get Reagan good press. And it was great. And I got an opportunity to go to the convention and was out on the floor when he got the nomination. I love that man, and it was such a pleasure to be able to work for him. Oh, yeah, he, he's the best. Um, one thing that probably happened at your park, and I, I got this more from reading your book than how I remember it, but the freedom brought out interesting things in people, let's just say. It, it seemed to free people up to be jerks, not only to employees and other people around them, but even to themselves at times. I mean, keeping that under control, you were working there every single summer. I, I mean, how on earth did you achieve that? You know, every day was an adventure. You know, if this, if this park was set in Maine or somewhere in the Midwest, it would have been a whole different story. But we had New Yorkers and folks from New Jersey. And, you know, a guy would come up one day with his girlfriend and he'd look around and he'd just be chomping at the bit. And then I'd see him back the next day with like 10 of his buddies, the craziest buddies he had. And sometimes it got out of control. Sometimes they just got so excited. They pushed the limits and. We had to kind of pull them back in, and there's a lot of crazy stories about what happens in the park. But overall, people were there to have a good time, and uh, they did. They certainly did. Yeah. Oh. And I tell you, I did. I did, and all the kids that worked there it was the best job we ever had. Oh, believe me, I read the book. I know you had a fun time, and I know everybody around you did as well. Um, uh, let, me, let me go through a few of the rides here uh, for people who aren't familiar with, uh, with Action Park and never actually made it there. Um, let's just go through a few of them here. I remember one that was crazy. Uh, and I remember really clearly as, and later on thinking, I can't believe this actually existed. Did this happen or did I dream this? In, in I believe it was in the Roaring Springs where there was just a giant ledge <laughs> and the, you just walked to the edge of it and jumped off and that was the ride. And there was just people all below you and you just tried to land in a place where there wasn't a person. Did that actually happen or did I dream it? You know, that was the cliff jump. And uh, when my father built this grotto, he dug out the side of the mountain, built this huge pool, and he had slides and cliffs and everything all over. And when he said it was done, I said, what do you mean it's done? You mean people could jump in from anywhere here? He says, yeah, that's the point. I'm like, but they'll jump on each other. Yeah, no, they weren't. But so we had to manage that. But the thing that was really great about that cliff jump is you, when you were up on that cliff, everybody in the place could see you. And often people would just go, but you'd see someone get up there and have second thoughts about it. Oh, yeah. And they'd hesitate. And then if they chickened out, oh, my God, the crowd was unmerciful. <laughs> they would yell, free chicken, chicken. I mean, these were New Yorkers. It was insane. <laughs> it really was. Um, uh, let's, how, about the, uh, how about Surf Hill? Give me a little on Surf Hill. Uh, Surf Hill was really my favorite ride because it was, imagine a giant slip and slide that, that is put on the side of a mountain with water running down it. And it was really slick and we had different lanes. You could race your buddies down. But what was really fun is the ninth, the ninth and 10th lane had jumps. So you could actually get in the air and the jump was actually adjustable. And we used to go in there at night. I'd bring my buddies and we'd bring the jump way up and we would soar through the air. I don't know how nobody ever got hurt, but we didn't. <laughs> uh, I, I remember also uh, the water slide, and I can't remember the name of it. It was, I think it had, because it, can, it was cannonball related as well, where you came out of a tube, a great water slide, but you came out of a tube instead of into the pool like every other water slide on earth, you came out of the tube like 10 feet above the pool and then crashed into what I remember to be ice cold water. Yeah, the rumor was that we like, uh, had a chiller in there, put ice cubes in there in the morning. But the, the truth is it was in the shade. It never really got any sun. So it was mm -hmm. always colder than uh, the other water. And it, it was a shock when you would get shot out and land in that water. But it was fun. Yeah, that was a really fun ride. Um, and there's one more you feature in the book, and then we're going to take a break. But this is uh, it, um, I, this one is another one that never quite made it to fruition. The Bailey Ball. What the heck was the Bailey Ball? Uh, there was a guy named Mr. Bailey who had an idea, and my father said, come on, let's see if we can make it work. What he wanted to do was put a man inside of a ball inside of a ball, and you would sit in a chair, and the <laughs> idea was he wanted to build a track down the mountain for this ball to go in. And the guy showed up, and he started building it, and it seemed to be working well. He built it a little more, tried some more, and it looked like it was working. And so we were going to open the ride, 
and we had the state inspector came. He was a little late, and it was the first hot day of the year, and the guy had built the track out of PVC pipe. Well, anyway, Frank got into the ball. He set off, and what happened is that in the heat, the PVC pipe expanded, and the track just fell apart, and the ball released. Rather than going down the mountain slowly, it went straight down the mountain. It almost hit the inspector. He dove out of the way, shot across the park parking lot, crossed Route 94, Thank God it didn't have any cars and into the swamp. Frank was okay, but that ride never opened, I can tell you that. <laughs> That's quite the understatement. Okay, we'll be back with more here in just a second. We're back with Andy Mulvihill, uh, author of the excellent book, Action Park, Fast Times, Wild Rides, and the Untold Story of America's Most Dangerous Amusement Park. You have to read this book. It's just it's just fantastic. Let me give you a, a quick moment from it to kind of tell you uh, 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 exactly who Andy's dad, Gene, was. Uh, here's, here's a quote. Andy comes in after a little bit of an issue, says, I collapsed into his leather office chair, exhausted from the heat and exertion. We got a problem, I said, waiting for him to look up. He didn't. I explained that if we couldn't see the bottom of the pool, that meant we couldn't see any people at the bottom of the pool. Andy, he said, shaking his head, you can't see the bottom of the ocean either. <laughs> I mean, that's that's an interesting way of describing who your dad was. You know, he we, we always tried to do the best we could and make the place as safe as possible. But, you know, it was always a struggle. And uh Sometimes we'd have cloudy water and I'd argue with him whether we really should be open with cloudy water. And he'd say, look, the ocean's cloudy. Lakes are cloudy. Why can't we have cloudy water once in a while? So, you know, I don't know. I was a kid. I didn't have to worry about the receipts and making payroll. So, yeah, no. Um, I, I, one thing that I thought was really interesting about the book is you know, you're writing a, a book about your dad, basically. Like, the, I mean, a lot of this revolves around your dad and his ideas and 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 how all this came came together. And the book isn't a fluff piece, I wouldn't say. Like, there were moments in the book where I was like, did Andy th see him as just a reckless figure, or did you see him as, as someone who was really well-intentioned? How, how did you see your dad? Well, you know, you, ha you really have to read the whole book from beginning to end mm -hmm. to get the full picture of who he was. And, you know, I had to be fair about who he was because I was okay with it. I, I, I think that he was not a reckless guy. He was a risk-taker. But he was a calculated risk taker and he was incredibly talented. He was a guy that if he failed at something, he'd just go on to the next thing. And he had a lot of confidence. Um, but no, I had I forgot incredible admiration for him. But look, he was a he, he was a guy, a little devilish. He was a fun loving guy. And he took us all on a journey that was incredible. And uh Boy, that action park, what a run we had. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I will say by the end of the book, I wound up just loving your dad. I, You know, the, a guy who's going to go out there and just take uh, take the risks. And, you know, you definitely got the sense that for him, I think you said, you phrased it in the book at one point like this, where he, he started with a thrill and worked backwards. You know, he wasn't trying to manage everybody's life to this perfectly easy way. He wanted you to have that moment. He wanted you to feel something. And then he tried to make it safe after he kind of realized where the thrill would be. That is the sort of thing that I think is missing from every amusement park today. Yeah, you know, you know, when you get these big conglomerates that run amusement parks now, they probably take years and 50 guys and studies to decide what ride to build. My father, if he saw a ride he liked, he in an instant make the decision that he's going to do that. And even if they said, well, you can't put that ride up there, he'd say, yes, I can. Just watch me. He was that kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, he definitely was. Um, he, I will say he was um, creative uh, among many things. Um, for example, the incredible insurance company you guys had, uh, London and World Insurance. Wow, what a, what a fortunate thing you came along with that company, huh? Well, I have to say he was maybe you can look at it a couple different ways. You might say he was ahead of his time. Because uh, self-insurance is very vogue now. Yeah. And back then it wasn't. And he just looked at the premiums he was paying and the deductibles. And he said, I might as well just do this myself with all the money I got to put up at anyway. And he managed it himself. The problem that he ran into is he his landlord was the state of New Jersey. They required an insurance policy from the, a reputable company. And his was just a paper company. And he ended up getting himself into some trouble. But ultimately, 
things smoothed out and he, and it all worked out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that what you just said is going to shock people because we haven't mentioned actually that this was in New Jersey, which is got to blow people's mind around the country that this this park could have existed in New Jersey. It doesn't seem possible. But he wound up getting this, uh, essentially creating his own insurance company uh, and did wind up getting in a little uh, trouble for that. Um, you know, the, the park got hit all the time on this on the on the injury thing. And um, one of the ways your dad dealt with it was instead of sending people to hospitals if they got hurt, he actually brought on a private doctor. Again, a lot of this stuff I think people saw as reckless, but was really ideologically consistent with the way he saw the world and the way he saw people. Yeah, you know, hey, look, he decided that he was going to take on the liability of these accidents himself. And so he managed it. And how he managed it was smart. So first thing, if someone got hurt, we would absolutely talk to them and interview them. And it was amazing how nine out of 10 times the guy would start by saying, well, I was screwing around or I didn't follow directions or I jumped on my buddy's head. That was really helpful in us defending ourselves where we found that we were at fault. We would pay right away, reimburse, but, you know, reimbursing the expenses, you know, the way the, the hospital system worked, if, if the person was injured enough, they had to get in a, an ambulance to go to the hospital. The bills were huge. So he said, well, why do I have to do that? I'll just send him if it's a minor injury to, to my friend down the street here, this doctor that's a GP. And he did it and he saved himself money. And then when it came to like litigating, if he, we thought we had a sound case, we were famous for never settling. We never settled. We went all the way. And it was shocking how many times we would win the case. Mm, that's amazing. Um, you know, there were, as you mentioned, some really rough things that happened. You go through these in the book. I mean, there's some really rough times. Uh, you know, I was there. The park I found to be safe and really fun when I was there. But there were several people who passed away at the park. And it, it's why I got a lot of these like crazy nicknames. Um, you tell the story in the book. You actually pulled one of these people out of the water. I mean, this was an intense time. And you're a, a kid. How did you deal with this? Well, you know, it wasn't easy. Um, it was certainly very tragic when we would have a, a death and it had a huge impact on all of us. Um, but, you know, you got to realize we did everything we could to try to make it safe. But, you know, when you take people and you put them in water, um, things mm -hmm. can happen. I mean, 2017, I think there were 37 deaths in uh, water related deaths at the Jersey Shore. So, you know, we did everything we could to help folks out. But sometimes we didn't quite get it all the way. You know, the, the, as I said, the Jersey Shore lakes, you have these mishaps. They stay open. Uh, it was tragic. And uh, it's certainly not an excuse, but it happens when you put people in water. And sometimes, you know, people don't know how to swim and they jump in the water and they really shouldn't. I'm not saying that was necessarily the case here. But it was a very difficult thing to deal with. Mm. You tell the story of the wave pool because you were you worked a lot as as a lifeguard at Action Park, um, and that was like it strikes me as both, like the craziest job in the park and also the best job in the park. Uh, in that you know, I mean, you talked about the first day the wave pool opened with everyone you know running in there. You asked for something very basic, which was like, can we at least have one place where everyone goes in so we can keep track of people? Your dad <laughs> just did not like lines, uh, so he would not let that happen. Um, you know, when you look back at that time, I mean, it sounds there's there, the drama is there, of course, from time to time. But it just sounds like it was a lot of fun to be a part of. It was, you know, the um, when we as you said, when we opened that wave pool the first weekend, by the end of the weekend, all the lifeguards, they were literally shot, and I thought half of them were going to quit. I mean, normally, if you're a lifeguard in a summer job, you might make one save. Kids were, some of these young guys were making 10 or 12 saves a day. Wow. It's harrowing when you go and save somebody. You're almost putting your own life at risk. So it was tough. And, but I, you know, I, I would, there were a lot of people there that I'd call through to find the right personalities, responsible kids. And it became like a badge of courage to be a lifeguard. We paid them better. You know, we took care of them. We got them special jackets. And it really was this camaraderie that grew up to the point where we were having competition with other water parks, you know, to see who had the best lifeguards. So, <laughs> and they all, I can't tell you how many of them are my friends today. Uh, it was really it was a neat thing. It was kind of like a team, like a bonding thing. Yeah, and you kind of manage them, and you, you you go through in the book how you tried to keep them, because it's not easy to keep kids on a summer job. 
uh, the parties were pretty legendary. Uh, you know, there's a, you know, you kind of think of almost like uh, Caddyshack in real life. Like this was a, this was, there was a lot going on. Uh, a lot of uh, alcohol was flowing. Um, there was a cot in a room by the pool that God only knows what happened in there. It was, it was, it, it was, again, the same sort of idea where the, the, it wasn't managed to this level of rule that you'd think of what would happen today. It was, it was a crazy time. I mean, is that how you look back at it as positive, but just kind of insane? Absolutely. I mean, I can't believe some of the things that we did, and I can't believe some of the things that my father led us to. Maybe he didn't know about some of them. Um, <laughs> you know, the, we, we, were, we did probably too much of the alcohol, and there was a little bit too much smooching going on. But you got to realize that you know, our, my father's kids cared and they worked hard and they surrounded them with kids that cared. And so we kind of looked after each other, even when we were pushing the limits, but it was like, it was kind of like a family. And so we were looking over each other's shoulders, you know, in retrospect, I don't know that we would have allowed, I would allow it to go quite as far as it did now that I'm a, a grown man. But <laughs> yeah. It certainly was wild times when we would open that park in the middle of the night and bring our friends in there. It could be pretty fun. Yeah, let me give you another uh, excerpt from the book. Again, the book is Action Park, Fast Times, Wild Rides, the untold story of America's most dangerous amusement park. This would be number two, guys. Uh, like the kamikaze, Surf Hill also involved what I'd come to regard as the physics of inadvertent nudity. People would shoot down the slide at high speed. The water acted as a power washer, stripping them of bathing suit tops and bottoms. Sometimes they'd even get back in line or even all the way to the exit without realizing they were at least partially naked. With 10 lanes of people going down at once, it became a, starting, a startling display of of synchronized stripping. One day I arrived at the bottom of Surf Hill and saw the snowmakers hovering over the wooden planks, erecting something near the lanes. What are you doing? I asked Charlie. Work order from your dad, he said. For what? He wants a spectator platform, Charlie said. <laughs> I mean, this, these are, this is a wild, wild time and a, just a fantastic read, Andy. Yeah, you know, that, that, that little segment kind of got me in a little trouble. <laughs> um, it's, it's a little innuendo in the book. There's no way that my father put a platform up, up for people to view nudity. But look, those, those rides, Surf Hill and some other rides, sometimes it would strip your bathing suit off, men and women alike. And uh, But Surf Hill was a lot of fun. And with those jumps, it was great to watch. People loved to watch. So... I don't think he put it up so that <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, it was just an impressive physical feat to watch people go off of that thing, and I, you know, I that was certainly why people were there. So uh, let me take you to the to the end here. You know, things kind of uh, wound up. You know, there was so much pressure on you from government authorities. It, you seemed to be cover, uh, constantly warring with them, and eventually, uh, you know, things wound up uh, going the other way. They once you guys left the park, they reopened it under another name. Um, and I thought I found it interesting, and I did not know this until I was reading the book, that you guys actually bought it back later on. What, how did that come about? So uh, when my father decided to exit, it was after 20 years, it was time to move on. He couldn't get a refinancing done. He had some lawsuits built up. It was time to get out. He sold to a company called IntraWest. They're a big ski area uh, owner and uh, developer of villages. And they decided they wanted to build a ski village at the, at the mountain there. So they got rid of three quarters of the amusement park. They really fundamentally changed it. And they built, they started to build their village. They put a lot of money in the ski area. And then after 10 years, the company needed to sell some assets. And they said, hey, we're going to sell this thing. And who's standing there but Gene Mulvihill? And my sister and I are like, Dad, you're crazy. We're getting back into that business. <laughs> we had gone down the valley and got into the golf business and hotel business. We have a great resort called Crystal Springs right down the valley. And that business was like a grown-up action park. It's mm. a lot easier to run. But he says, no, 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 no. There's too much of an opportunity. We're going to take it back. So we took it back. And we, we made a run at it for a few years. But it just, the whole world has changed. There was a lot more competition, a ton more regulations. It just wasn't any fun anymore. Yeah, yeah. You said after, um, your dad passed away uh, years ago now. Um, after he died, it was after he died that you renamed it Action Park. Is that right? Yeah, we, you know, we bought it with him and then he, uh, we only had it for a year or two. There had been a, a tenant in there and then he passed and we were trying to figure out how to get the thing going again. I mean, the, the attendance was a tenth of what it used to be. So we figured, hey, why not? Let's just try to bring the Action Park name back. We got a ton of press and we started to try to get some rides that were a little bit more exciting, but 
and like I said, it was just a battle that was almost not worth fighting. And uh, I'm not one to give up, but I'm also know when it's time to move on to the next project, which we did. Sure. Yeah. Pick your battles. Um, uh, so the legacy of, uh, of Action Park, it's got there's a big documentary, I guess, coming out on HBO Max. Have you been uh, are you a part of this? Or are you going to be in it at all? You know, I know the guy that did it. He did a great job with uh, Mashable. Uh, they had a mini documentary some yeah. years back. It's online. And so I hope that he did a good job. He hasn't shown it yet, so I don't know whether it's <laughs> what kind of perspective it is. But the good news is I didn't participate in that, and I didn't have anything to do with the Knoxville thing. And so the story that's in my book really hasn't been told on film. And guess what? We made a deal with 20th Century Fox Television and Hulu. They're going to do a series based upon this book. So oh that gosh. has got me excited, and I can't wait to have uh, have my father – and his life story told on the big screen. And what's really cool about it is those are Disney companies. And my dad always held Disney up as the gold standard as amusement park operator. So I look up at him and I say, hey, dad, look what we got. We got Disney doing a little uh, something about you. That is so cool. You did him proud. You did him proud. I will say uh, this is there's about 20 seasons of a television series in this book. Uh, so many great <laughs> stories. It's a fantastic read. And I mean it legitimately. I loved your dad at the end of this. I mean, this is just a it's a great book and a great telling of, of a story of a guy who was a real pioneer that maybe not everybody knows about. Again, it's Action Park, Fast Times, Wild Rides, the untold story of America's most dangerous amusement park. Uh, Andy, I can't help. I can't thank you enough for coming on and doing this. You know, you honor me so much by paying the honor to my father. He was a true American pioneer. America needs more men like that. Amen. Sure. Thank you so Amen. much. Amen. Thank you so much. Back in a second. We're only two weeks away from the supposed beginning of baseball, and there's one really quirky issue that I'm following that no one else is, which, uh, as America's only Toronto Blue Jays fan, America's team, uh, they have this little issue of crossing a border like every time they play a series, and that's kind of complicated in the era of COVID-19. You just don't do that anymore. They had to get a waiver to be able to go to practice, and basically, if you know the Blue Jays stadium, they have a hotel attached to the field, so you can actually watch games from your hotel room. It's pretty, yeah, it's still pretty cool. Um, it's been around for a while, but it's still pretty cool. Anyway, that's where all the players are staying inside that hotel, so they cannot leave the the the, the uh, premises at all. They found out today that if they get caught off the premises of this hotel or field, there is a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar fine and potential jail time that could be instituted. That's because of the Quarantine Act in Canada. Uh, will any of them show up for work? I have no idea. We'll give you more about that if, as it develops. Back in a second. Trying to sell your home is challenging, especially if you have to sell it to pay a $750,000 fine. You don't want to have to do that. Uh, you need a real estate agent that you can trust. Realestateagentsitrust.com is a company that Glenn himself started. Mr. Glenn Beck, the person who started The Blaze, started realestateagentsitrust.com. Why did he do that? Why did he do such a thing? Well, he was trying to move, and, you know, Glenn moves like every three months. It's like his, the, ever since I've known him, he's moved. He's always wants to move. Uh, and so he's dealt a lot with real estate agents over the years, and he's had some bad experiences, and he thought, well, why don't we have a, a way to sort through this situation? Who are the people getting the best results? Who are the people that always get great you know, reviews? Who are the people who everyone's recommending that know them, but unless you're in the middle of uh, you know, some circle of friends, you're not going to even uh, know they live or know they even do this job. Real Estate Agents I Trust does all this work for you. They have ex uh, capable, experienced people who will see your selling process through to the very end. If you're looking to purchase a home, be sure to partner with the best. The name says it all, realestateagentsitrust.com. Learn more at realestateagentsitrust.com. Check it out. If you're going to buy or sell a home, why not buy it for the least amount of money and sell it for the most amount of money? realestateagentsitrust.com. Okay, Stu Does Power Hour is just seconds away. Make sure to go to YouTube slash Stu Does America and uh, check it out there. To play at home, you're going to need a shot glass. You're going to need approximately seven normal-sized beers. And you are going to need something on the table uh, because you're definitely going to start spilling it later on. It doesn't seem possible, but trust me, this happens. Sarah Gonzalez, Jason Buttrell, uh, we've got uh, Chad Prather, we've got Bill Richmond from Louder with Crowder. It's going to be a really fun time. Thanks for letting this show last for 100 episodes. It's because of you. I can't believe you made it happen, honestly. <laughs>